So our first speaker is R. Venkatesh. He is uh, the chief scientist and head of uh, the foundations of computing science uh, research at TCS Innovation Research Labs. Uh, so yeah, he uh, works extensively uh, on uh, applications of formal methods in several industrial problems, uh, and he's going to talk about some of those today. Uh, he's also uh, currently the chair of the ACM India Education Committee, uh, the vice president of uh, the Indian Association for Research in Computing Science, under whose aegis this uh, FSTTCS is being held. Uh, and he's also a member of the ACM Worldwide Education Committee. Uh, he uh, leads a very strong team of formal methods at uh, TCS, and uh, their team has won several awards, including at the Software Verification Competition Award uh, in recent years. So with that, I'll hand it over to Venki. Good morning, everybody, and thanks to Suprathik for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for having me here, and apologies to everyone for spoiling your Sunday. Uh, so, this talk I'm going to present more on applications of uh, SAT SMT to industry scale problem. So firstly, let me acknowledge, almost nothing is my work. So it's all, these are the guys who have done it. I just get the privilege of presenting all that uh, to you. So here is a long list of people who have done it. I might have missed some names here, but it's not mine. So the main point I want to make in this talk is that SAT SMT has a wide range of applications in the industry and we have been using it in a lot of many ways and very successfully to solve actual industry problems which are being useful. I will present two of them here. Uh, one is for proving properties of programs uh, which is an interesting application of SAT SMT and also one optimization which was that's very different. One wouldn't imagine using SAT SMT for applying for con uh, optimization problem and I'll present what we have done out there. There are many other places we have done, but due to lack of time, I won't be getting into details of that. Another point I want to make is, yeah, there is SAT SMT at the bottom, but you need to do a lot of massaging to the problem encoding before you can really exploit it and take advantage of SAT SMT to use. But SAT SMT. So whenever customers come to TCS nowadays, I tell them, one of the things I tell them is SAT SMT is underutilized in the industry. It's got much far greater potential than what it is used for and it's underutilized. And they are started listening to us and they come to us more and more with more and more problems saying, can you do this using SAT SMT? Can you do this using SAT So it's uh, gaining acceptance in the industry. So the main theme, naive encoding just doesn't work even for the smallest of industry problems. Yeah. It just doesn't scale for the smallest. So you have to put in a lot of effort into getting the encoding right so that it uh, scales up. And uh, you, for that, you need to exploit domain properties. It's not something that can be completely automated. Of course, how, whether it can be automated is an interesting question by itself. But one needs to know the domain and exploit properties there to be able to scale SAT SMT to industry. So the first part of the talk I'll be talking of uh, about using SAT SMT for verifying programs, which in itself is an interesting uh, application as you'll see. Uh, there we are exploiting two properties. One is, uh, first one I'll talk about is invariant templates. You know, how do you guess invariants? And I'll motivate the need for guessing invariants uh, to do that. And second is a small model property. I won't talk too much about the small model property because I don't think I'll have time. I'll get into a lot of details about uh, one particular technique we use for invariant template that is searching through a syntax base. I'll talk about that in, a, in great detail. And in the optimization, I'll say how to exploit equivalences. So there are multiple things which are equivalent. If you can somehow inform, uh, encode that into the sort problem, the search space narrows dramatically and uh, therefore it helps you. And extending partial solutions, how do you split a problem into uh, small components, solve one problem and then try to extend it to the uh, next part of the problem. So those are the two main points we want to make in the second part of the talk on constraint optimization. So the verification problem. 
uh, is you're given a piece of core. Uh, we'll assume C for now. And you have given an assert and you want to check whether the assert holds or not. This is the classical uh, verification problem. And uh, the challenge here is programs have loops of unknown bound. And SAT SMT cannot uh, handle loops in general. So you need to somehow get rid of uh, loops. So what we do is try to prove properties here. SAT SMT is very good, has been used successfully to find bugs in these. Because there you can unroll loops for a finite uh, bounds. And then if there's a bug in that finite bound, you have a bug. But when you want to prove it, you need to somehow abstract it out and uh, try and eliminate uh, the loops. So we try to eliminate loops and you'll see one technique that we, one technique I'll present on how to eliminate loops, but there are several other uh, techniques of it. And for all our applications of verification problem, we use CBMC, which is a C bounded model checker, which takes a C program and converts it into a SAT formula before it gives it to a, a SAT solver. So the reason we use CBMC is it does a lot of floating point encoding, integer encoding and all that it does. So we don't have to worry about all that. And uh, so that's the problem that we'll address. So in this talk is going to be about invariants and how to discover invariants. And so it's a brief introduction to invariants. Most of you should be knowing what it is, but for those who are not, it's a property that holds invariant at a program point if you're given, it's a property that holds at that program point for every run of that program at all times. So whenever code reaches that particular point, it holds. That's the, that's an invariant. And what is interesting is uh, what is called as a loop invariant. It's something that holds when you reach the head of the loop, that is when you reach the loop, and it holds within the loop at every iteration because it's something. And an interesting property of uh, loop invariant is the final one. So finally, when you have i and not b, it holds at the end also. At once you have terminated, once a loop is terminated, the loop invariant still holds, and the not of not condition of the loop condition holds. Yeah. So that's a loop invariant, and this is something that we'll be exploiting in the technique that I'm going to present right now. Right. So as I said, loops in general are difficult to solve using uh, SAT solvers because you need to unroll them at SAT, you can unroll them only uh, a finite number of iterations and you still want to prove a property. So when you want to prove a property, you want to say it holds for all runs. So you can't really do it for a limited number of runs. CBMC is a bounded model checker. What that means is given any loop, it unrolls it for a finite number of times and it checks, converts that to a SAT formula and as, checks only for that property. So the property may hold for all runs or it may not hold. But if there's a bug, it usually, the bug is there. So it's a very effective tool for finding bugs. But to prove properties, you need to somehow abstract the program. So what do we mean by abstraction? Uh, abstraction of a program is another program which allows more runs than the original program, right? So because it runs, it allows more runs, if a property holds in the abstract program, it also holds in the original program because the abstract program allows more runs, right? It allows all the runs of the original program plus more, plus some more. So these are two things that we will uh, do. And uh, so invariant is a way, invariant is an abstraction. So if you run a program only for states that for which the invariant holds, then it's an abstraction. So it allows more runs. It may allow more runs than the original program. So invariant is a way of abstracting program and it allow, helps us eliminate loops by abstracting it. So here is an example. So you have a simple loop here, x is equal to y equal to zero, it's initialized. While star, star means it's a non-deterministic choice. So at any, whenever it hits that while star, it may enter the loop or it may not enter the loop, but you don't know what that condition is. And then you have x is equal to x plus one and y equal to y plus x. At the end, you have to assert that y is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Here we are assuming there are no overflows uh, for now because overflows add an entirely different dimension to the problem. So for now, we assume that there are no overflows and we assume that it's been checked that there are no overflows, let's see. So we want to assert that y is greater than uh, zero, greater than or equal to zero. Yeah. So here we have potential invariant 
uh, assert that x is greater than or equal to 0 and uh, the assume here says that at this point you assume that that x greater than or equal to 0 holds. So, you are only going to consider runs where x is greater than or equal to 0, you are not going to consider any other runs. Yeah. When you say assume x is greater than or equal to 0, you are saying that consider only those runs where at this point x is greater than or equal to 0, others you just abort. And then here this is the invariant at the end of that loop body assert that x is greater than or equal to 0 and because you are not changing it, it goes up and then you want to assert that y is greater than or equal to 0. So, what we have done here is we have got rid of the loop because we have introduced invariance, uh, we have got rid of the loop and and therefore, if this pro if the property holds for this program, it will also hold for the original one, right? Yeah, ha, huh. uh, proof of whole, uh, there is it. The only difference is we are uh, proving it using whole logic for all kinds of uh, programs is hard because you need to come up with the logic, logical argument why this holds for each individual program separately. Whereas, when you use a SAT SMT solver, it is just a single, you really do not care about the bodies, it, the SAT SMT explodes all the entire state space to get the, that is the a basic difference. So, depending on the program, you have to come up with a argument, a proof of why that is an invariant. Whereas, when you are using a SAT SMT, it just explodes the entire state space uh, by brute force and using brute force and therefore, it is a more uniform way out. So, it is more automatable whereas, whole logic is not that automatable, that is the primary difference, yeah. So, the question is how do we discover these invariants? that is, so one way to discover these, yeah, uh, because, so invariant has to hold when you at the initialization point. So, you are checking that it is to check that it is indeed an invariant, even there I have fudged a bit so that it fits quietly in the, but that assert is correct. So, you have to show that the invariant holds when you reach the loop, the initial. At the beginning of the loop. At the beginning of the loop, that is what that assert checks for. Okay. Then we are forcing the x should be more. Then you are making an assumption that it holds for an arbitrary number of iteration. Mm -hmm. So, you are proving inductively and you are checking that it holds at the. There needs to be some more things that are done to get it absolutely correct, but just for compactness I have presented it this way, yeah. So, we are going to look at one particular technique to discover these invariants and uh, so what we are going to do is search in a carefully constructed syntax space. So, we define a syntax space search in that syntax space for various expressions and check whether that expression is an invariant or not and we'll check whether that expression is a safe invariant or not. So, what do we mean by safe invariant is it is an invariant and it is also proves that the property holds the property that we are trying to do. So, in this case x greater than or equal to 0 is an invariant, but it is not a safe invariant. So, it is inductive but it is not sufficient to prove that y is greater than or equal to 0 because y can take uh, any arbitrary negative value. So, we want to search through a grammar, define grammar and see and this technique is used fairly, now it is used quite a bit in program synthesis and even before it was used by Daikon to find likely invariants. So, Daikon is a dynamic tool which uh, has templates looks at runs and sees what which of those templates holds. And now, Sumit Gulwani's team in MSR, Joshua Tannenbaum's team at MIT are using this technique for program synthesis where they define a syntax and explore that syntax space for all programs and check if any of those program is a valid program, is a program for which these examples are. So, it is a similar idea. So, program synthesis and that is why we are calling it invariant synthesis where you search through a syntax space to check to for all through all expressions to see and see whether that is an inductive invariant and is it a safe invariant, yeah, these two properties we really look for. 
The key challenge here is that the search space is really large. The program syntax, the syntax page of expressions is really large. So the main problem is on how do you restrict the search space. The main challenge is how do you restrict that search space so that you hit a good invariant soon. That's the key challenge, be it for program synthesis or for invariant uh, synthesis. One common technique that is used is to assign probabilities to syntactic constructs so that you search, you pick uh, more likely expressions more often and less likely expressions less frequently. That's the standard uh, technique that is adopted and so that you hit a good invariant very quickly. So that's the crux of the problem, how do you uh, organize them? And we can also get some assistance from data, that is if you run the program, you can get some assistance. Daikon does that, which is runs the program and uh, you can, it's easier to analyze data for invariants rather than the program itself. So that's what we will be. So what we are going to look at is can we restrict the size of the grammar by looking at the program itself. So pick up syntactic constructs that are present in the current program and search through only those constructs to look for invariants. That's the main thrust of this book. So consider this example, the same example again, uh, x equal to y equal to 0, x equal to x plus 1 and y equal to y plus x in a non-deterministic loop and you want to assert that uh, y is greater than or equal to 0. The safe inductive invariants for this are x greater than or equal to 0 and y greater than or equal to 0. Yeah. x greater than or equal to 0 is inductive but it's not safe, y greater than or equal to 0 is safe but it's not inductive. So the safe, uh, safe and uh, inductive invariant is x greater than or equal to 0 and y greater than or equal to 0 or x greater than or equal to 0 and y minus x uh, greater than or equal to 0. So the question is how do we search through the, what is the syntax space that we search through to discover these expressions quickly and be able to scale in a scalable manner. So again this is just an example uh, where what we are do, what we do is look at the constructs there in the program and derive, a, extract expressions from whatever we have seen at the, in the program. So from x is equal to 0 the initial x is equal to 0, you get x greater than or equal to 0 and minus x greater than or equal to 0. So we do not use equal, so x equal to 0, you get uh, x greater than or equal to 0 and similarly for y, you get uh, minus x, y greater than or equal to 0 and, uh, and then you have x plus y as an expression and because greater than or equal to 0 is there, we get x plus y greater than or equal to 0, similarly y greater than 0, yeah. So these are expressions that we get. We extract these expressions from their program, we assign probabilities to it. We will see the next slide gives more details on how we get the expressions and the probabilities uh, for this program. Having ad discovered, uh, identified these expressions from the program code, we search through all expressions and check is it a inductive invariant, safe inductive invariant or not. And when we hit a safe inductive invariant, we stop or we time out, these are the two uh, things that we do. So we really don't find bugs, we only check for whether it's a correct program or not, yeah. Programs, so some algebraic closure of the… Yes, yeah, so we, so we will see in the next slide. Okay. You will, yeah. So here is how we get the sampling grammar. So you have a the constants, we take whatever constants are there, uh, indices, we take uh, 0 is always there and uh, 1 and minus 1 come from that x greater than x and this uh, x greater than equal, because x equal to 0 you get uh, 1 and minus 1. The variables are of course x and y, these are the only two variables that are there in the program and uh, linear combination of variables k dot v plus k dot and then you have uh, the candidate which are disjunctive expressions, yeah, inequality and uh, right. And the probabilities itself is, are determined by frequency of occurrences 
of, uh, so for each of these constructs for k equal to 0, 1 and minus 1, we are at, uh, assign probabilities to 0, 1 and minus 1 depending on how frequently they occur in the program as a, yeah. Similarly for uh, greater than equal to and uh, greater than, we assign probabilities based on how frequently they occur in that piece of code. And that is how, so once we have assigned probabilities and we have built this grammar, constructed this grammar, we explore this, the space, defined, the language space defined by this grammar, selecting expressions based on probability, using the probability distribution that is defined, right. Having selected an expression, we check if it is a safe invariant. If it is not a safe invariant, we abandon it. If it is an inductive invariant, we retain it even if it is not safe because it could be conjuncted with another invariant later. Occurrence in the program. Yeah. So that is just one part of it. Uh, then we conjunct that, like I said, conjunct that have already been proven to be inductive, we retain and uh, that can be conjuncted with any other expression that we discover to be see to check whether it is. So for example, uh, in the in the example that we saw, x greater than or equal to 0 is inductive, but it is not safe. So if we hit x greater than or equal to 0, we should, we discover that it is inductive. So we retain it even if it is not safe. And then if we sample y greater than 0 equal to 0, then we can conjunct it with x greater than or equal to 0 to check is it inductive. So uh, that is how we and we use some very simple uh, this thing to eliminate. So if you have already sampled uh, x greater than 5, we do not sample x greater than 4 and so on. But these are very simple rules that are encoded to check. We do not use SAT SMT to check for such. Uh, and then finally, we also use uh, runs of the program to check whether there are likely invariants or not. So we run the program and then we, in the run we have this bunch of templates and check if any of those templates hold for those runs and pick that with the high probability as a invariant to be checked. And there is also work that has been done on uh, getting interpolants from bounded proof. So basically you get a expression, you know that it is not a safe invariant, you get a trace that is generated and use that to derive an interpolate to get the next potential invariant. That is the interpolate from. So these are additional things that we use to restrict the space, not restrict actually, order our search through the expression space so that we are likely to hit an invariant faster than what I'll say. So now how do we handle uh, multiple loops? So here again. For the first loop, the invariant is x plus y plus n equal to m. The second loop, it is x plus y plus n equal to m and n equal to 0. And the third loop, it is x plus y plus n equal to m and n equal to 0 and x is equal to 0. To be able to show that m is equal to 0 at the end. So we need to discover three sets of loop invariants which together are safe. So you need three loop invariants which together are safe safe. That is the problem here. And uh, so basically both uh, arbitrarily x and y are incremented. So x plus y is uh, plus n is yeah. and m is equal to n. So the this works because m is equal to n out here and you are incrementing x and y while decrementing n to 0. So x plus y will always be uh, m at the end of this and n becomes 0, right. And uh, here again you are decrementing m till x becomes 0. So now y will be equal to m and then you are decrementing y till m becomes, y becomes 0 therefore m becomes 0, right. So uh, when there are multiple loops, again for a large program if you take the syntactic constructs from expressions from the entire program, the search space still becomes pretty large. So we restrict ourselves to each individual part of the program.
to extract syntactic constructs. So, for the first program we take all these x equal to 0, y equal to 0, m, m equal to star, n equal to star. Basically, m equal to n is something that can be uh, discovered there plus variables used in these loop, in this loop. Those are the expressions that we use to define the syntax space for the first part of the program to discover an invariant, right. Then for the, so that gives us this set of expressions and from that you get the grammar that follows. This grammar is very similar to what we saw earlier. So that is the grammar that we, this is the space that, that we search for. So we have the space, we have probabilities and then we search through this space to check is there an invariant. Hmm? Uh, it comes again x equal to 0, y equal to 0. So x greater than equal to 0, x uh, minus x greater than equal to 0. So if you have x equal to 0, you get x greater than equal to 0 and minus x greater than equal. So you get minus 1. Coefficients. They are co k is all coefficients of whatever coefficients have been used to the variables. So k should be 0 also. And, uh, so this defines a syntax space and we search through this systematically given probabilities, using probabilities. We search through this uh, systematically till we find an invariant. Then for the next part of the program, that is you, for this you have those expressions and from that induces this grammar. So the second loop has those expressions and that induces this particular grammar. Remember, notice that n comes here. From the first loop, all we get is the negation of the condition. n not equal to 0 makes it n uh, equal to 0 at the end of the loop and that is the condition that we get and we that induces this particular grammar. And then for the third loop, again x not equal to 0 gives x is equal to 0 and uh, it induces this particular grammar. But a uh, note one thing that in all these grammars, we will see the next uh, slide, the invariant we wanted was x plus y plus n equal to m and none of these grammars really produce a three element expression. They all produce at most a two element expression. So here you have a two element, we will see in the next slide anyway, yeah. So, you have a two element expression here kv plus kv whereas what you need is a three element expression which is not there in the code. So you need x plus y plus n whereas at most you can get x plus y. You cannot get x plus y plus n uh, using this grammar. So this is an invariant that cannot be, that is not part of the language defined by this grammar. Yeah. The invariant is not part of the language that is defined by the grammar. So that is where we use data. So one simple way is of course we can say these expressions can be arbitrarily long but then it won't scale up because then it, the language that is defined becomes much larger. Yeah. We can, uh, one way to correct rectify this is just enhance the grammar, enrich the grammar to define a much richer language but then the language, the sentences in the grammar becomes too many and searching through that space does not scale up, right. So instead what scales up really well is dynamic analysis. So you have runs of the program, there you can search for a much richer uh, set of templates, especially all linear templates uh, you can search for and from those traces what you get are likely invariants you get some properties that for that are true in the traces. Now those are additional expressions that you can consider for your safe invariants, whether check whether they are invariants or not. So they are likely invariants, their traces do not tell you that they are invariants but they give you ex expressions that are likely invariants. They eliminate, traces eliminate a lot of expressions and they read. Uh, so they only identify some potential ones. So you can use those and then check whether those are invariants in your program. Again, apply the same techniques that you do to 
check whether it's an invariant or not. And you can once you have an invariant at a the first loop, then you discover x plus y plus n equal to m for the first loop quite easily. Now that can be propagated also because there is no none of them are modified between the two loops because there is no expression between the two loops. Therefore, it f falls through to the head of the second loop and therefore, it becomes a potential invariant for the second loop Sim and you can show that it is indeed an invariant. Again it falls through to the third loop because there is nothing no expression between the two and uh, so those invariants can be propagated and you search your search space now becomes richer slightly richer and then you search through that to get the invariant. So, to check whether it really helps, we tried this on uh, several uh, benchmarks and compared it against uh, Freecon is the one even tool on which this has been implemented and uh, here are some numbers. So, it does indeed help scale up a bit. So, this is all a uh, 5 minute timeout to discover invariance on these programs. So, what is interesting is it also helps discover nonlinear, basically disjunctive invariants too. And the probability assignment also helps. So, when you run it without probabilities, it solves only 65, whereas with probabilities, it solves uh, 81, where probabilities were derived purely using uh, frequencies, occurrences, number of times a property occurred in the program. Yeah. No, we don't look at the data to derive probabilities. The data we use only to uh, come up with likely invariants. So, the program synthesis community looks at program sets to arrive at probabilities. That's a possibility. Like I said, told him uh, the programming, uh, program synthesis community does that. They look at uh, all possible programs to arrive at uh, probabilities of expressions. We haven't done that, but I do believe that that's a useful way forward. Uh, but then I think it won't be that straightforward. So what they do is to get all the programs, they randomly generate programs, which may not be representative of practical programs. And so it's getting that data is not that straightforward. And they work on Lisp, so generating randomly generating programs is much easier. Right? So, now we look at extending the same ideas to arrays, programs with arrays. So, till now we saw examples of programs without arrays. And uh, the obvious question is how do you expand, extend it to programs with arrays? Because you obviously need to introduce a quantifier for all uh, in this case, but uh, it can be anything actually for all of their exit. Uh, and what is the search space? So, you want to extend it to arrays without impacting the search space too much. You do not want to enlarge the search space by too much, you still want to be scalable uh, while you are still doing. Uh, so, we just do not want to add a for all arbitrarily to the grammar because then it tries for all kinds of uh, quantified variables and that explodes the search space. And so, how do we restrict that search space so that we are able to search through it and uh, so here is one program. So, the first loop uh, just finds the minimum m in the array. Second loop just subtracts and third loop just sums up bi's and then you just want to say that uh, this thing is greater. So, here we assume a is are all uh, non-zero, uh, greater than zero sorry. So, m is the minimum element, smallest element in the array. The second loop just subtracts from 
m from a i and assigns to an element in b and the point is that all elements in b are greater than 0 because m is the smallest element that is the key point here right. We assume and then you just want to assert that s is uh, greater than or equal to 0. So, how do we get these quantified expressions? So, we just introduce an arbitrary uh, a variable j and look for quantified expressions in the loops the loop uh, bo uh, head which is in this case for i equal to n minus 1 i greater than equal to 0 i equal to i minus 1. So, we have j i less than j and uh, which is less than equal to n minus 1. Yeah. We get that expression from the first loop. And from the second loop we do get this from the first loop and uh, we ad additionally get this right hand side expression. Okay. This expression we get from again from the first loop and this expression we get from the second loop because it is there in the second loop. So, there are there is a quantified part of the expression and there is a right hand side part of the expression. The right hand side part of the expression we do exactly what we did earlier, but there are some array expressions now that is about it right. Because here a i is being used which is the loop variable we just use here replace that i with j and say for all for j equal to. So, we take the expressions that are there in the loop body replace the loop index with the newly introduced variable j and we get a get an expression and for the third loop we get that additional the s greater than 0 of course, we get from the last. So, the right hand side of the expression is exactly like what we did earlier except when there is an array expression it is the if there is a loop index inside the array expression that is you replace by the quantified variable, but otherwise it is exactly like what was done in the for the rest of the. So, this just explains uh, what we do. So, introduce uh, a quantified uh, expression introduce a single quantified variable j for all the loops because there the scope is anyhow local uh, to that loop and the expressions for the quantified variables are based on the counter variables here. You get the expressions based on the loop heads if it is a for loop you get it from, we assume it is all for loop and we get it from the loop heads. And the cell formula itself is grammar constructed from syntax as we had done earlier. So, what we are really doing is trying to restrict the search space remember that our strategy remains the same define a grammar through which you can search for and then use the same loop propagation uh, induction uh, the invariant propagation techniques where that we used there earlier. So, here this just comes to the next one right and this is the invariant you discover for this that is of course, there in the loop body. So, there is nothing uh, yeah. So, now if you are given a i is greater than 0 you automatically get s s greater than 0 at the end of. So, this is something that we use to get expressions the grammar and the expression space through which we can search for invariants. Having done that it still does not always necessarily scale it does not necessarily scale to. Uh, so, wherever possible we try to eliminate yeah. You are using SAT SMT to do the sampling? No, no SAT SMT if we finally, if we use all this we do not use SAT SMT till and then once we have transformed the program with the invariance we use SAT SMT to check is it a safe invariant. I see. So, the sampling is done. Uh, sampling we are not doing using SAT SMT. Sampling uh, so, we just so, there is no sampling really. You have to sam you have probabilities so, given probabilities yeah, yeah we do not we have to sample through a grammar yeah. yeah. So, that we are not using. So, for that we will have to encode the grammar and we have not even given it a thought to be so honest. Some kind of important sampling. Uh, yeah correct it is a possibility, but uh, we have not really given it a thought. So, there is there are other applications to where we could use SAT SMT for sampling, but we have not yet tried that. So, in some cases you can eliminate the quantifier 
yeah, you won't get into details, but you can uh, eliminate, especially when you know that the loop body only one or two indices are used, then you can, uh, where tiling kind of ideas can be used, borrow to eliminate uh, quantifier. This thing. So here for example, you have for instead of saying for all j, you can just say that the next iteration it is doing that because the rest of it is not getting modified. So tiling ideas can be used here and we also uh, generalize uh, sub ranges. So and here are the experimental uh, results that we have had for this particular idea. So booster used to be a fairly good uh, array tool. VIAP is a pretty good array tool and they have the best array scores in SVCOMP last year, right? Yeah. So it does uh, indeed help. And more importantly, I believe that this is a fairly general idea that can be expanded for programs that have invariants. Because not all array programs are, may have, may be provable using an inductive, in, not all loop programs may be provable using inductive invariants. But if programs can be used using inductive invariants, I believe this is a fairly good framework to use. We need to of course generalize, make the search space thing more powerful than what has been done, which is right now we are just sampling from grammar, maybe we can think of extending it a bit more. So the way we might go is run the program, get generate some data, discover some likely invariants, analyze the program. So for example, here we are looking at only syntactic. There is a whole stat static analysis gives a rich set of relationship between variables. You use that information to define uh, the expressions that needs to be searched because static analysis will be able to tell you what variables are likely to be in the invariant much better than just looking at the syntax. And so this whole approach I think is very promising when you want to solve a large or use one a very generic technique to prove a large uh, property of set of programs. Otherwise what happens is you have some technique to solve address a specific class of programs, another technique to solve another specific class of programs. This I believe will work, should be able, we should be able to extend this to work for programs that have induct that do have safe inductive invariants. And, uh, so in summary, we have a guess and check framework for uh, invariant synthesis and we will continue to expand on this. This guess and check framework allows us to reduce a program with loops to a program uh, without loops so that we can use a SAT SMT solver to check whether the property holds or not. And, uh, this of course right now we are using it only to prove correctness. We are not really using it to, we can't use it to find bugs. To find bugs we will have to uh, extend this further. And this general, yeah. Uh, I might have missed this but uh, in this guess and check framework, if uh, a particular candidate invariant does not uh, work, do you get any feedback that you then use to guide the search through the grammar? Uh, do we get a feedback we use? I know right now, except in the mechanism where we, uh, the interponent that we do. So if there is a, it does not, if it is not an inductive invariant or it does not, we generate the SAT SMT generates a trace, we use that trace to get an, in, uh, can be used to get an interpolant to find the next. That is the only place where we use it. Maybe I missed something here. Yeah, I, I, I get the flavor of the approach. The point is, you know, there are there are tons of spurious invariants which are true. I mean, for example, true, you know, it will always be true. It will be inductively true, true, correct. True, true. So surely you are doing something more interesting. So do you rule out, you know, the, the ones which are not useful? I mean, see, this is the critical thing, right? Yes. So you, do you, for example, aim for the strongest invariant like Dijkstra did or? No, no. So we do not infer the strongest. We infer, infer safe invariants. No, no, but a true is a safe invariant. You don't it's need not, any method. True is not a safe invariant. Okay, it's too large. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm saying. So is, we our search stops when we hit a safe invariant. Okay, false. Huh? False is a safe invariant. Yeah. 
False is false. If you start with false after the iteration, but you it take that too. Yeah, yeah, of course. Ah, okay. So you have a forward flow uh, for consistency. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. we don't discover the strongest invariant. We discover safe invariant. Yeah. As soon as we hit a safe invariant, we stop. Ourselves. Okay, my examples are bad, but uh, there would be many, many invariants. So which yeah, are you're not right. Relevant. You're right. So firstly, the, our syntax search restricts uh, our search quite a bit. And uh, secondly, if we discover an inductive invariant, which is not safe, we may consider it next time or we may not consider it the next time. Yeah. So it, we don't always uh, include it so to again restrict the size of invariant, to get, eliminate spurious invariants. But at the same time, we don't totally eliminate it because it could be useful. Yeah. Absolutely. So when, when you said that um, the uh, one example that you had where you had x plus y plus m plus n and you did grammar did not generate it because it won't scale up, it is exactly for this guessing part it won't scale up. Checking wouldn't have been a problem. Guessing is the scale up. Scale up is largely the guessing. Uh, the, the, guess, the number of the search space. Okay. Yeah. It's a search space that we want to restrict. Because it's guess and check that entire search, that entire iteration that we want to limit. Yeah. So that is just one of the ideas that we have implemented in this tool uh, very apps. But what is common to all of them is this program abstraction which takes a arbitrary C program and converts it into a program that does not have loops. That when I say that does not have loops, it means that either it does not have loops at all or it has small finite loops with small known number of iterations, which is equivalent to uh, not having loops because you can just unroll those loops and uh, eliminate them. And these are the techniques that we have been uh, implemented in that. One is array shrinking or pruning, which is something we did with uh, Sanyal here and uh, Shravan and Sanyal. Loop acceleration, which we have been doing for several years. K induction is another thing and loop invariant generation, which is what we so I think the other three have already been presented in some SAT SMT school or the other. So we chose the loop invariant one uh, for this one. So and then now you have an over approximated program which does not have a loop, it does not have loops or loops with small finite bound. That you can use a SAT, a bounded model checker or SAT SMT formula to, that you can translate to a SAT SMT formula and then use a solver to check it. That is the general framework uh, that we use. And it has uh, done quite well as far as the SVComp uh, competition is concerned. We mainly participate in reach safety because it is ours is all about uh, proving uh, properties. We are not, we do not participate in their concurrency or any of those. And uh, these are the numbers from last year. This year too we have entered but results are not yet out and uh, so it does help these SAT SMT is fairly useful in being able to scale up and the competition includes SEGAR kind, a uh, lot of SEGAR tools and I think CPA checker the second is a SEGAR based uh, tool, interpolant, uh, tool using interpolants. And then there are uh, bounded model checking tools which they have used all kinds of techniques to uh, scale it up. So ours is the only one that really translates it into a SAT SMT formula and then checks for whether it uh, holds or not. Great. And we have applied this even for industry programs where we use it to so we have a static analysis tool which generates a whole heap of false positives and we use this technique to eliminate uh, the false positives automatically. And it has been fairly successful in very large programs, 400,000 lines, uh, million lines kind of code. We have applied the similar technique to eliminate false positives. It does not solve all of them but it eliminates quite a lot of uh, false positives automatically. There is still a lot of room for 
improving scalability and improving the checking for. That brings me to the second part of my talk which is uh, harness uh, constraint optimization. So this is a problem that uh, where a customer came to us and this is an automotive customer. They came to us and said all automotive uh, vehicles have uh, they have to schedule before a vehicle goes into production, any model goes into production, they need to test it thoroughly, test for all features and uh, test under all, con all kind of conditions. And because the this thing is, uh, so what we are doing is there are a lot of constraints when they do these tests. So a feature has to be tested, uh, automotive manufacturer may produce uh, several models of a car and these features have to be tested on each of the models. Uh, there are constraints which says that certain tests have to be performed before certain other tests. There are certain constraints that a certain test has to be the last, crash test being an obvious example. It is the last test, it has to be the last test on a car. There are constraints on schedules which says that all tests, because they want to ship out the model, so they have all tests have to be performed before a, a certain date. That is another constraint that they have and uh, tests on one model are independent of the other. So if you, there are uh, manufacturer models, two models of cars, they are independent except test uh, the testing facility capacity. They use the same testing facility and that capacity is limited. So those limits are also known. Manufacturing capacity is limited because when they are manufacturing these test vehicles, they can only manufacture one or two vehicles a day. They, they are not in a production floor yet. So they can only manufacture one or two vehicles in a day. And the objective is to minimize the number of test vehicles. So if they reduce the car by one, they save a million dollars. Yeah. The number of test cars, if they reduce by one, they save a million dollars because the, of the whole, because manufacturing one vehicle is pretty expensive. So that is the problem. And it is not initially obvious there are integer linear programming, there are a lot of optimization uh, solutions for optimization problems and so it is not immediately obvious that one would apply SAT SMT to solve an optimization uh, problem. So, but this came to us again just because I had been telling everyone that SAT SMT is being underused and so they said okay prove it to us. So here are some uh, constraints, priority constraint. So if a car has a priority over another, it should be tested. Uh, if a test has a priority, one test has a priority over another, then if it's being, two tests are being performed on the same vehicle, the higher priority test should be performed before the lower priority test. That's the priority. Tests obviously cannot overlap. You cannot perform two tests simultaneously on a car. Last to be done, first to be done on a car, which they call as position for some reason, uh, end dates. There are some tests which have to be done on the same vehicle and there are constraints on the infrastructure, assembly order. So for again this is an arbitrary constraint, the car that gets manufactured they want to perform more tests on those cars. It is a, it's a requirement that they have for some reason, I do not know why but they have that re uh, requirement. And testing facilities of course are available and then there are geographical constraints. So Cold tests have to be performed in colder regions, hot tests have to be performed in hotter regions. So you need to ship cars from one place to the other. The constraints are many. And the problem is to minimize the number of cars given the number of uh, days. And some of these constraints are soft. I said they do not mind them being violated, but you have to violate as few of them as possible. So you have to minimize the number of cars and violate as few of these, some of these soft constraints. Uh, as possible. So what we have done is model this as a SAT problem and use Z3 as a solver, SAT SMT problem. And uh, one advantage of uh, modeling it as a SAT SMT is modeling is easy because all these constraints naturally fit into a, a logical framework, a SAT SMT kind of framework. You do not have to encode it as an integer problem. Uh, whereas if you are using an ILP solver, you have to encode all of this as an integer problem and uh, try and 
So, we felt that this is more intuitive if it works well and that is the reason we modeled it as a SAT SMT problem. So, a naive encoding into SAT SMT would be as follows. These are some examples. So, you define car as a function and uh, whether a test car as a function on which a test is being performed. So, if car i equal to j then uh, test i is done on car j that is what it means. Similarly, start date is a function, end date is a function where you have start dates and end dates that uh, defined as. This is a straightforward position. Remember position is a test that has to be performed first on a car. That is no other test should follow a test that is a position. So, this just says for amongst all tests if that test is being performed on that car it should be performed after the position test. So, that is the first one. Second one is priority which essentially says if two tests are performed on the same car then the higher priority test should be performed first. So, if i has a priority greater than j, i has a priority less than j then yeah. So, I said it the other way up. Then end of i should end uh, before j starts. So, overlap is test should not overlap that is an obvious uh, constraint and we started off with this naive encoding which which does not scale because there are about 1000 tests that need to be performed but which leads to around 1.1 million variables and around 10 million constraints. So, when this whole thing was encoded this is the uh, numbers we got. So, even scheduling tests is a pretty challenging problem and this is something they were doing manually using excel sheets and uh, using a whole lot of uh, domain knowledge. So, one of the first steps we did was we split it model wise. We said we will model each problem the test problem for each model of car a separate problem. So, that it gets split into multiple uh, problems. This is not always optimal. So, what we do is we run it for the uh, one model derive. Uh, so, for instance test facility capacities those, those will change. So, certain tests are performed at a certain facility between on a certain date let us say. Now, that capacity is utilized for that date. So, that we add as an additional constraint when we are performing the next model. So, we solve for one model derive ad additional constraints when we are solving for the next model. So, that no constraints are violated. So, no, none of the constraints will be violated when we are doing it model wise, but what will happen is you may not get an optimal solution. So, you may get a sub optimal uh, solution that is the uh, limitation and uh, right now we do not have a workaround for that. So, we say we will live with the uh, sub optimal uh, solution for right. Then there were apart from uh, just splitting it across models there were other changes that we had to make because even splitting it on across models did not uh, really help uh, was not sufficient. So, there are certain constraints the dates in particular start date end date and that whole there is a start date and an end date combination which adds a lot to the complexity uh, on uh, this thing. So, instead of using the start date end date as a complexity we introduced something called an order. So, you just say order just define the order in which tests are carried out on a car. Order is a function that non deterministically determines that order in which tests are carried out on a car. So, if uh, then you have an order constraint which just says if order i is less if i is less than j and they are both performed on the same car then the test i should end before test j starts. So, you eliminate a lot of these start date end date uh, constraints that are there. So, now all these becomes uh, become much simpler using order instead of start date end date position in particular becomes really simple uh, as a encoding. So, you just have that order of whatever is the position test is position test has to be have an order 1 on whichever car it is it should always have an order 1. Then priority also 
instead of combining start and end, now it just compares orders. And uh, that's what priority does. Similarly, for overlap. You overlap, you just say order, they are ordered, so that two no two tests are the same order. So another requirement that they have is the tests have weights. They give weights to tests and uh, cars that perform, so if you accumulate weights of a test on a car, a car that has performed more weighted tests have to be manufactured before cars that are perform that have that carry out fewer tests in some sense. If you assume weights are same equal and one, then it's translates to that, but tests do have weight, so it's weighted sum of tests carried out on a car. Whichever a car has higher has to be manufactured before other cars. And uh, so we had you earlier encoded it as an if then else. If weight is greater than then manufacturing of that car should be uh, before or at the same time as the manufacturing of a lower card. And then instead, uh, later on what we did was just fix, again non-deterministically fix the order in which cars are manufactured. So car one is manufactured first, car one, car two. This notice is a domain knowledge because you're saying two cars are equivalent. Two cars of the same model are equivalent. And you really don't care, you don't want to really try all orders of cars. This is just exploiting equivalence of cars uh, when there are tests. So you fix the manufacturing order of cars and then say the weights have to be higher. So it gets rid of the if then else, which if then else is a fairly expensive operator when it comes to uh, SAT SMT. So here are some numbers. So when we did the model wise split, if there are 8 and 6 cars we are talking of, so these are very small, the number of tests is 52. Yeah. We just had 52 tests, so we had some examples with just 52 tests. If number of cars are Z3 times out, after we merge constraints, it does it in 4 minutes and 72 minutes, time out is 480 minutes. So as you can see, very simple changes in encoding which may, things that may seem obvious, bring out a dramatic change in the scalability of a test. So the eliminating the if then else for manufacturing or the where we're just e exploiting equivalence of cars, reduce it from 4 and 72 to 2.5 and 5.5. Okay. But that's for 52 tests, remember we need to do for 1000 tests. The problem is to do it for solve it for 1000 tests. This is for the next three models. Choice elimination is the this one where the cars are same. Of course, here I am showing one example. There are various places it applies. There are, remember, there are 10 million constraints and also the number of constraints is all. I am just picking, picked up a few examples here. There are many other optimizations that have been applied. Here are some examples of these optimizations. Yeah. So, uh, just two clarification questions. So here you are it not really solving an optimization problem, right? It's solving, there is no cost function. There is a cost function. What is the cost function? Uh, one is of course we want to minimize the number of cars. Okay. That's one. Second, many of these constraints are soft constraints. Uh -huh. And violating this, uh, there is an associated cost. And then how do you combine those? Yeah. Uh, the linear combination? So there is a, Z3 allows you to give penalties and uh, okay, you I can see. minimize. Uh, so this is Z3 opt? Z3 the, opt, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, but I don't know finally what we use because I think Z3 opt by itself does not scale. So we just did okay. a binary search okay, okay. to, okay, that is what we did. I think Z3 opt, am I right? Z3 opt did not uh, really scale okay. by itself. So we did a binary search. And then the second is, uh, so that if I understand the theories, it is, uh, Linear arithmetic, uninterpreted functions, and quantifiers. Yes. Right? Those, yes. That, that particular yes. combination. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're right. So this is the numbers. And here is our comparison with the ILP solvers. And so we used we encoded the whole thing in Gurobi. 
which is a which is one of the best ILP solvers that is available. And for 13 tests it took around 30 minutes and uh, recollect here we are from here you can see we are doing 53 tests and 97 tests. So, 13 is uh, very less and it is just not. So, Gurobi just did not scale up uh, encoding it in an integer linear program. Okay. And then we had a uh, so, we had one intern Aditya interning with us and he believed that these two would do significantly better than SAT SMT and therefore, he encoded in both and so thanks to him we have these numbers right? uh, where neither an integer linear programming nor a pseudo billion solver really scaled up uh, for the problems that we have. And uh, I believe it is because the integer ranges per se in this problem are very small. Yeah? The integers per se are very small. So, the largest integer is a date which is goes only up to maybe 500 or 1000. They, they are not really large integers and I think when the problem the integer space that you are looking at is uh, fairly small. I think SAT SMT does a better job of it than and although he said that the only theories we are using are quantifier elimination and all that. I think Z3 just reduced most of a thing to a SAT and it did not use any of the theories. At least that is what the log seems to indicate. So, we are not sure whether it employed any of the theories at all and for, uh, but we are not sure of that. That is what we believe by looking at the logs and uh, Yeah, so this is I think more of a comment because in my experience for problems like these which are can be just converted to a normal set Z3 actually does not perform well. Uh, so, for example, okay in pseudo volume solver you should consider open WBO and uh, maybe if you can let me know the numbers because I am one of the authors. Uh, so, so yeah. For problems so, yeah, like yeah this, we are very happy to share stuff uh, with you. And so, uh, yeah, I, mean, I would love to get these numbers on OpenWB how it fares because so which I mean, one my did experience use? for problems like this which can use. So, OpenWB itself uses uh, out of the box uh, set solvers like mini set or glucose or something. Right. So, maybe OpenWB with glucose should probably. So, which one did we use, Madhukar? Oh, yeah, but which one did you do, you remember? Pseudo bullion rounding set. Yeah. So, yeah, we will so be very happy. This is from my experience that right? Z3 does not scale that good when you can just do a normal. Yeah. So, you may be right. So, we will we'll be happy to try it out and check whether it works or not. So, at least this is our finding. He is going to counter us on this. I know. I Let me tell you, when Aditya came, he said, this is just not the way to do it. You should be doing ILP solvers and or boolean pseudo boolean solvers or something, but SAT solver is just not the way. We said, okay, do it. It may work. We are happy if something works better because this is a real problem which you are solving and uh, they are using this tool. So, the automotive company for whom we are work doing this, they are using the tool that we have developed using us. So, we will be happy, they will be happy to find a better solution. And uh, so we are most happy. And uh, so the interesting question that comes up is we spent a lot of energy and time finding a good encoding. Yeah. A very iterative process. At the end of it, we are not even sure which encoding worked, which encoding helped the most, what encoding did not help us too much. It is some encodings worked sometimes, sometimes they did not work and all that. So it is not really clear. So, the question is can this be done automatically? So, if I can we just say take the same problem, but reduce the number of tests to something where even and do a search to find what encoding works for that and hope that the same encoding works for uh, all other when you increase the number of tests. So, is that is that something that can be done automatically uh, is a question that we have. And all our encodings work correct because we had a way to check that the encoding is correct. So, we had a, so there was no bugs there. So, that is a problem that we will be interesting, interested in to find is there an encoding that will be 
that will work or not. Yeah. So in, in the manufacturing context, uh, typically, when the first lot goes, right, so a lot of the start put into that. And very rarely as you progresses, even anybody realizes the stability of the production process to eliminate that test. And this is a very chronic problem in all manufacturing. Right, so I'm happy to see some modeling and I'm from Philips, so. Yeah, so you're we, right. We, we, we just to add, uh, we're not doing vehicles, we do medical devices. And since the criticality of the device is so much, nobody dares to touch it. Right. And without any data-driven uh, judgment, I mean, it's very difficult to eliminate because then you can be jailed. Sure. So those are the risks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Suddenly, the model will be very, very helpful and save a hell of a money and the time if you really prove okay it's not necessary correct absolutely you're right uh, and of course another requirement of uh, these manufacturers is that they will do these tests something will fail so their entire schedule goes for a toss and they want to do it incrementally without affecting the final sh sh release date as much as possible so that's uh, another requirement that's also part of the tool that we have uh, developed. So, those are two applications that I said, but these are other applications that we have explored at uh, SMT for harness optimization, card game bridge. We are trying to see if we can encode uh, bidding rules using SAT SMT. Uh, one thing that is not mentioned here is we have also another car manufacturer uh, came to us and they wanted to just count the number, all automotive manufacturers support users to choose configurations. So you can say I want a sunroof, I want this, I want that, I want that. So they just, from a business perspective, they just wanted to count how many configurations are they supporting. Yeah. This is so that, because they want to make it manageable, so they want to reduce the configuration without impacting customer satisfaction and all that. So they just wanted to count how many configurations they are. That's something we again did for an automotive manufacturer using a SAT co counting uh, tool. We used hash SAT for that. Uh, then these are worst case time exit are more more research things are they are not really applied, but you are trying to use for worst case execution time of a piece of code and uh, also a scheduling algorithm. We are translating those into SAT problems and. Applying it. So, there is a wide range of applications in which we are using uh, Saturn. Yeah. That is the, brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. So, any last questions? Yes, thank you for, for your talk. It was very interesting regarding the pseudobillion uh, part. And uh, I think, yes, the testing with the rounding set is one thing, but uh, there are many others. And the open WBO is probably also something to consider. Uh, are the benchmarks available? Because you know what is really important for software designers is to have benchmarks. I know. And <laughs> if, if you can make those benchmarks available, it's uh, or even maybe the description of the initial problem. Because the way to model it, there are many many different ways to do it, and uh, it's typically crucial. And uh, you have people also from constraint programming who really are, uh, Interesting. because th this problem is typically a constraint programming yes. uh, problem. And then you have uh, the best constraint uh, solvers currently do automatic translation into that using a huge, very sophisticated encoding, but you, you have to do it from the constraint, from the domain level. So you, you do not do it by hand, so you really need to have uh, the constraint expressed at the highest level. So yes. uh, I would, well, if it's possible for you to make, uh, maybe a bit with fake con um, we can see, so see. fake Unfortunate instances. thing is it's not a decision we can take, yes. it's our customer's yes. data. Yes. So yes. Yes. No, no, I but uh, maybe not real data, but yeah. uh, at least some kind of fake data and right. real constraints. So that would we help. can check that out. And uh, yeah. Yeah. 
So, so I, th I think I agree with on this point that uh, maybe some kind of normalization, anonymization of data, so, and then if you can give us the like I said, it's not something we can even take a call on. <laughs> it's not our data. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not data that belongs to us, and uh, so we would. But so if there's an intern who's someone willing to intern with us and explore that, that's something we can give them access on our premises. That's a much easier problem. But yes, we will check whether it can be done in some form or the other. We did try some constraint uh, solver also. I thought Aditya tried that also. And uh, yeah, we tried constraint solving also and uh, where you can express it at a high level. I just don't remember the tool we tried. Uh, yes. Yeah, we, we tried one of those. I, I, uh, the constraint solver and that also didn't scale up. You are right, constraint solver gives a much higher level way to encode. Therefore, we were very hopeful that that will work. But again, this comparison I think is not a fair comparison because I do not think we put as much time in encoding into these as we did into a SAT SMT encoding. And maybe uh, several if you put a comparable effort into encoding into this, maybe we will get a better. But we are not the first people to find SAT SMT working better for optimization. There have been other instances where they have found SAT SMT to be. One, one key difference though is that something like Z3, uh, you can throw a quantified constraint at it. Yes. And that it's heuristic steep with the quantifiers. But here, you can't encode a quantified constraint into Gorobi, for instance. Correct. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, you know, what was the, um, whether you really needed the power of quantifiers for your benchmarks or you were just so turning we into did a bunch have of bands. quantifiers as you say, but they are all quantified over a small. Oh, I see. It's all finite, finite domain. Finite. Okay. Uh, it's not over an infinite domain. It's just quantified, just simplifies the expression. It's not. Uh, if you use pi z3, it just blows yeah. up the quantifiers. It just instantiates the quantifiers. I mean, wherever it can. Okay, so I think uh, with the interest of time, let's head for uh, coffee. Yeah, so and, thank you. Thank you once again uh, for your patience. And uh, yeah, let's thank Venkatesh once again.